Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et honorum mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen! Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 110% like big time, really. Oh, uh, yes. happy Easter, everybody. It's great to be back after resting and feasting and uh, drinking bunches of uh, merriment. Uh, I hope everyone's... Uh, shout out to the Fellowship of St. Anthony. hope you've been marrying your, your merry way into Easter with lots of uh, non-fast foods and uh, enjoying your Paschal Tide. It is a beautiful, wonderful time of year, uh, really unlike anything else. Uh, the liturgy goes... To the next level, hallelujahs everywhere, everything's at another level. We just had the Feast of St. Mark today, and there's an entirely different uh, rite for Paschal Tide apostles. Uh, and let me pull up the um, liturgies of the home here. We've got, uh, I love this so much because it's uh, this is exactly what we're going to talk about today, which is the theology of Easter. And uh, this is beautifully depicted in Liturgy of the Home in this because Christ is bringing out out of Hades. We've got Adam and Eve here, the old couple here. That's Adam and Eve. And then we also have St. Joseph, who was in Hades because he died before the resurrection. And Christ is pulling them up out of Hades together with all the other saints of the Old Testament. And uh, I love this because he's locking eyes with Our Lady as they as they as Christ resurrects and... Uh, that it just goes alleluia and we've got the easter week and uh here we are in low sunday so this is the week after easter we have uh, all the weeks after easter this week we have saint mark is today we have the greater litany so you can pray the litany of the saints today we also have a, a very big feast for, to me personally which is saint paul the cross we'll have a show on that this week uh we also have a very special show today on the guild or not today but later later this week we have the guild family stream which is going to be talking with a Russian Rite Catholic in St. Petersburg, Russia. And we're going to be talking to him about the history of Russian Catholicism and comments on all the current crises with Ukraine from the Russian Catholic perspective. So we've got a Russian Catholic, Russian Rite Catholic, not Latin Rite, but Russian Rite, Byzantine Rite Catholic in Russia. So that'll be a really interesting conversation this week. Um and what else is happening on my announcement oh we've got the aussie and oceania group growing in the guild so if you want to be a part of the guild access the guild stream and all that patreon.com slash meaning of catholic so we're just starting that so shout out to all the aussies there's a there seems to be a lot of aussies and oceanites who watch this show the monday morning man show uh which is it's 5 a.m. Eastern time, 4 a.m. Central time, where Jack, Jake is. He's in 4 a.m., but it's like 7 p.m. 7 p.m. in uh, the land down under. I don't know if y'all, I don't know if y'all Aussies call it, all y'all call them yourselves Oceanites, but uh, that's what I'm going to call you because Oceania, Oceania is that whole region, Australia, New Zealand, that whole area. I don't know if Indonesia. Because you're an Orwell fan. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know much about that region. I mean, I know that they're they're entering winter soon. They're like it's it's fall there right now, and they're it's going to be winter. That's all I know. And uh, it's I've heard that Australia is so large. I was talking to Matt Fred about this. Um, Australia is so large that if you're driving from one end of the Australia to the other, it's like a 24 hour road trip. 
And if, if you see somebody on the side of the road, you have to stop to help them because if you don't, they'll, they'll die. Basically there's like, cause there's nothing in between, you know, for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. So it's just a, you know, that's the outback for you. So anyways, Aussies, if you want to join into the guild to be a part of that. So that's just designed for all Aussies and Oceanites to unite against the communists, uh, unite against the Marxists in very tangible economic ways. We're going to have a show soon with the Aussies about a community in New South Wales region, I think, or Victoria region. Uh, Victoria is the state, especially that's been in the news a lot with a lot of insane crackdowns, uh, dictatorial type measures about the vaccine and all that fun stuff. Um, so we'll get into that. Uh, let's see. So what's going on with the Kennedy report this week, Kennedy? I was waiting for some equipment to, uh, finally come in. So I, cause we got a new camera and stuff and I just, I needed a capture card and, uh, of course, you know, Best Buy and Walmart and the source and all these places just don't have them for some reason, um, no matter where I go. So I had to order it from Amazon and it takes like a week because I live in a region where it's speaking of the outback. It takes about 24 hours just to drive across one province here in uh, the un- province of Ontario. So um, <clears throat> Australia is all right, but they're not, as, they're not as cool as they think. You know, they're not as big as they think. Um, <laughs> actually. There's a fun relationship between Canada and Australia. We're kind of like, we call ourselves like sister countries. And uh, they, they sent all the prisoners to Australia and they sent all the lunatics to Canada. That's how it went, I think, with the Great Britain. <laughs> they said, yeah. you know, we want the prisoners to be able to work. So we're going to send them to a place where they won't die because of uh, scurvy. And then we'll send everyone we don't like, including the French, to uh, Canada. Anyway. Uh, so we'll have some videos this week. Um, I don't plan ahead very much with the videos. I just sort of walk my dog and think about things and then I do a video on it at some point. But uh, one thing I want to talk about though, this is back to my, this we've been talking about conspiracy theories and red pills and too many of them. There's this theory about snake venom. I'm not going to say too much because it's YouTube, whatever, but it's been going around and apparently that's the origin of the whole thing. And it's crazy in my opinion. Um, uh, it's not even that it might not be true, but just the whole thing is getting to the point where it's just like a reductio ad, ad absurdum. It's just crazy. And I think that there's an omen in there. Uh, when you go down the rabbit hole so far that you find snake venom, you probably <laughs> you should probably stay away from the serpent. I think we read about that somewhere before. And um, so I'm going to do a video called something like, uh, you know, snake venom in the rabbit hole. And um Again, it could be true. That's not the point. The point is, you know, it's like Genesis, for goodness sake. You know, <laughs> you can find out certain knowledge, but like it literally might kill you. Um, it might kill your soul because it's it's more of the pursuit of going after the the strange fire and so forth that you just don't need to do anymore. Um, and it's a waste of time. That's what I'm going to do. And then uh, I got some interview. Actually, I'm going to have Bishop Schneider, I think, on June seventh or something we were kind of talking to sophia about reviewing right. some books trying to get dan burke i think i'll have dan burke as well and uh yeah so pray that the capture card comes in so i can finally use the camera yeah for sure man yeah everybody go out go out and subscribe to the kennedy report really great uh, youtube show from kennedy you want more of kennedy <laughs> Poor person. Poor get, the, get the kennedy report um and uh let's see paleocrat paleocrat diaries you're continuing the mormonism I'm glad you're covering this insane cult. That that was actually formative for me converting to Catholicism. I was encountering the Mor- Mormons. So, I, so have you finished the Mormons, Paleocrat? Are you? Uh, on to no, them? I'm on. I have it today at Reason and Theology. So we're going to talk about uh, s- certain uh, distinctive doctrines of the Mormons, as well as some of the uh, presuppositional arguments against their metaphysics and their epistemology, because their metaphysics is super weird. And their epistemology is wicked lame, so it's 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 really bad. I mean, it's it's the feel fields. Um, it's you know everything's kind of based on the feelings, uh, whereas their metaphysic is strange enough because they don't really have like a heaven per se, right? Uh, there's other planets, and uh, so, so they're wacko. yeah they're magical materialists, and so they have Mormon uh, materialism is its own sort of thing. Um, And so, you know, you're and and not only that, but this infinite regress of gods that goes forever and ever. And they don't see the problem that that has for things like time or motion (laughs) then and there and do that kind of talk. But so we're going to do that today. Um, 
And then this week I have a number of things. I obviously going to be on uh, Wednesday and Friday, meaning of Catholic here. But I think that, you know, I've been doing the cult series, but I think I'm going to interject. I've done it before where I've, I've kind of switched gears for a second and I'm going to switch gears, I think, and talk about uh, apologetics and eventually talk about atheism, stuff like that. But I want to begin by talking about uh, the methodology that I use and making a, a strong case for it. Hopefully people at Catholic Answers will tune in because um, they're <laughs> we're, we're, we're bumping heads. But they won't say my name, though. <laughs> I want them to say my name. <laughs> so, say my I'm like, name. I'm like, you, you, keep, you, keep, you keep talking about these people over here, these Catholic presuppositionalists. And I'm like, there's one. <laughs> there's one with a YouTube channel, and it's your boy. So just say it. Um, but anyway, so we're going to talk about that. And it's going to be really cool because I'll go through uh, not only I, I want to talk about Knox first, but talk about his book, um, The Lost Works, and how he, he criticizes the very apologetic method that he helped to advance and that he wrote one of the great works for in the 20th century. Um, and he became critical of it at the end of his life. He never finished the book. It's a, a chap four chapters called Proving God. And he talks about the emergence of a new methodology. And so I'm going to talk about that just as an introduction, but then I'm going to use this book for multi-purposes. So people, if they could see that and they want to buy it, they can. Uh, Irenaeus, an Orthodox Apologetic Methodology, a Neopatristic Presuppositionalism. I'm using this because the guy who wrote this, number one, it's the best primer, and I can demonstrate easily why it fails being called Orthodox and show that everything else is great, but it falls for the same reasons that his final chapter in this book destroys Protestantism. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it is the most beautiful <laughs> chapter it just it sums it up so succinctly and just pounds away and i'm going to use that because the man who wrote the book who was an orthodox priest at the time that he wrote it is now an evangelical pastor and so i'm going to use his arguments against him and from a catholic perspective and demonstrate that the truth is in this book find their home of course in mother church my also last thing is uh i have this week i have two things i have david gray uh he's interviewing me on wednesday and that's going to be at 8.15 Central Time, that fake standard, that fake time that mm. Jake is living in. <laughs> we, we, we love David. David Gray. It's good. Yeah, David Gray. So Gray, he, yeah. it's the first time I've been on, been on his show, stuff like that. And, uh, and then I'm doing a, a speech on Friday. So if you're in town and you want to see that speech, it's, it's a group called The Inquisitors. They asked me to come in and talk about secular age. So I'll talk about the book, How Not to Be Secular. I did, a, I think, a 11 or 12 part series on it. Um, as well as tapping into the book, which is 700 pages. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that all the way, but I'll take, I'll take tidbits from it because how not to be secular is a summary of that. So that's, that's my very busy week. Sweet. The Paleo Krat, the hammer of the enthusiasts himself. I'm looking forward to the atheist series. Uh, yes. Fantastic. Thanks. Jeremy. And now running for County commission. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody vote, vote. Yeah. Paleo Krat. <laughs> it's true. I, I got mean, roped into that man. Yeah. Vote. Uh, yeah. County commission. Yes, yeah. uh, excited for for your local political involvement. Yeah. And uh, Jake, what's up with what's up with you? You've got uh, next series in your series. What's happening, man? Yeah, f well, far less exciting things than Kennedy or his his eloquency, the paleocrat. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so you guys have been saying Eastern time this whole. I thought you were saying Easter time. I was like, man, they're just always living in Easter time. I've never heard of Eastern. It's about as could... close as it gets. We we are. Yeah, we tell are me what that Eastern. is. I don't, it's celebratory I've never being it. Eastern Eastern time. It's mm -hmm. Celebratory. <laughs> and Michigan is is like fake Eastern too. You guys are Midwest. <laughs> You, yeah, sure, you, yeah. Sure. You, need, you need to join central time no yeah, but we are. in all seriousness <laughs> yeah we, you, uh, i mean you, you we we drive uh like two hours or so we yeah hit central yeah, time yeah two hours west because we have to go south uh is it that the, far well you have to go to chicago basically you hit chicago which is three oh, hours okay. away if from, you just uh, went due Grand west Rapids. over the over the great lakes but, i mean we'd be what, uh, if you're if minutes? you're in the if you're in the the low oh no i don't know if I don't, is the upper peninsula in central time at all it might be. 
I don't, I don't actually know that. The Upper hmm. Peninsula is whack. It's actually what? take. Do, well, I love it, Upper but it's, dude, it's, it's, Michigan, it's not bro. even connected. Yeah, but it's actually uh, gonna, it was peeled away from another another state. I'm glad it was. You're gonna get um, get me riled up if you mess with UP, man. <laughs> well, I'm saying that the the borders and everything. It's it's very strange. It doesn't even look like it. Would now we've got an inter Michigan war here. So <laughs> hey, you better continue. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Golly, uh, part twelve will be this week. Hopefully, I was thinking about it this morning. I was like, man. I should have done it on Saturday because 315 Central, the real time, that's when I have to wake up, which I really enjoy, actually, because it makes Monday so peaceful. Because after we after we finish recording and, and this is, uh, you know, dispersed into the interwebs that I can just chill. I'm already ready for work, you know. So speaking of, uh, in addition to whatever boring church history I can muster, only two weeks left of school, boys. Two yeah. weeks left. I mean, that's not yeah. true, not technically. But the seniors, I teach seniors, and they leave uh, May 13th. So I've just got a little bit longer with them. Hey, brother. And then right. on to other things. Yeah. Fantastic. That's awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, And I just found out, yes, Michigan, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, is in central time zone. Uh, I was just seeing if it was Lake of the Clouds, the Porcupine Mountains, one of my favorite places in Michigan, which is the west in the western region of the UP. Anyways, this is all Michigan stuff. Anyways, pure so Michigan. That legitimizes <laughs> your, your Michigan existence. You can rest uh, easy now. Yes. Everybody come to Michigan. It's a beautiful place. You won't regret it. Uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes was voted like the most beautiful place in America, wasn't it? Paleo crap. I yeah, but Sleeping Bear Dunes, that's not Upper Peninsula. That's true, but it's a beautiful place. I'm just saying. Michigan's I love all of gorgeous, Michigan. man. Dude. It's all great. Yeah, I, all great. I'm constantly promoting. Anyways, yeah, anyways, yeah. Come on, anyways, man. We, we'll go on forever. On. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go on forever. Oh yeah. man. See, so, yeah. okay. <laughs> so today we got a spicy topic. That is uh, SSPX critique, which I myself will will provide against the SSPX. But I will also say why the SSPX is right. Uh, I'm going to say today that the SSPX is right and wrong. Um, at least we're going to talk about this text right here, which is the, the problem of the liturgical reform, theological study of the liturgical study by the SSPX. Um, and I'm just going to be talking about one section of it, which is um, if you have a, a copy, it's page 39 and following, which is just the section which is critiquing the concept of the Paschal mystery. So I'm going to get into that in just a minute. But first, before that, I do that, I want to set the stage with... So what I'll do here is I, I have I have two critiques, uh, which I'm going to be calling the Eastern Catholic critique of the SSPX, because this has very much formed my mind as an Eastern Orthodox Christian. I was, in the, I was in the Greek liturgy for four years. I went through Holy Week for four years in the Greek liturgy. And when you go through the Greek liturgy... You and a whole all of Paschal Tide. Um, I think you understand this. What I'm going to explain, you understand the Paschal mystery, um, just in a very popular level. Not like we don't have to go into these all these deep theological things, but in a very popular sense, the popular uh, piety, which is so the most common thing with the Eastern Catholics is the the um, Christ is risen hymn, which goes like this: Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. That was what we just saw with liturgy. Of the home so notice what it says trampling down death by death and it, upon those in the tombs we still in life so the the central victory of christ in the paschal mystery is this, the destruction of death itself nullifying the power of death and that's the basic concept of the paschal mystery so let me let me get into this I'm, so i'll provide um i'm gonna just provide my first critique and then y'all can uh, I'll have all y'all's thoughts. And then in my second critique of the SSPX, I'm going to also bring in why is the SSPX correct in an important part of what they say, I think, in the second critique. So first critique, um, first, I want to bring out this excellent. This is uh, Carol Wojtyla, Person and Act. This is his central work. Um, it can be described as a Thomistic analysis on... A Thomistic analysis on the reality of the subjective. But this is his fundamental opus magnum. And he has this wonderful quote. If you have this English translation from, um, shout out to my friend, Jegosh Ignatik. He's the translator of the new 
complete works of uh, Carol Wojtyla. Carol Wojtyla is John Paul II, if you don't know. Um, so page 124, he says this. <clears throat> um, an aspect, an aspect can neither replace the whole nor displace it from our field of vision. If that took place, we would deal with the absolutization of an aspect, which always, which is always an error in the cognition of a complex reality. Now that's a bunch of gobbledygook, but let me, let me, <laughs> let me break down what it means. He's talking about a complex reality that has multiple aspects. A complex reality with, has many different aspects to it. And then he says, if you take one of the aspects and then you absolutize it so that that's the only thing that you say is true about this complex reality, then it becomes an error. But it's a half truth, basically. So you're just you're taking now in this context, he's talking about the false, the false philosophy of idealism. Idealism is basically the same thing as a subjectivism in a man you might call um, subjectivism is where. You think about the fact that you have a subjective brain. You can subjectively perceive things. And then you say, well, everything's subjective. There's no truth. Well, that's a absolutizing an aspect because it's true that you have a subjective mind. It's true. But you can't absolutize that. So this concept of absolutizing the aspect is what I want to bring into this discussion of the Paschal Mystery. Because the mystery of the atonement the mystery of what we celebrated at Holy Week and what we continue to celebrate through Lent and into Paschal Tide, this whole season of 40 days of Lent and 56 days of Easter Tide, is all one big mystery that the church is celebrating. And it's a mystery of atonement, which has many different aspects. And when we take one of those aspects and we absolutize them, then we get close to an error, potentially, if we use that to exclude every other aspect. So what we have is that we have a, a historical situation that arose because of things in the West where one aspect of the atonement became emphasized to a great degree. What is that aspect? Well, it's the passion of Christ, the passion of Christ, which makes atonement to offer up the justice of Christ's faithfulness to God to avert the wrath of God to appease the justice of God who is offended by the sins of men. This is the normal explanation that you might hear, many Catholics will still hear, to explain the atonement and the Easter Triduum and everything that happened. And this is what is, this is in Trent, this is in the Tridentine Catechism, Christ made satisfaction. Um, and uh, it's based on Anselm, it's based on other authors, it's popularized in... Based on the Bible. <laughs> It's based on the Bible, but especially it came out of Anselm in particular, where it became more prominent. I, I was going to mention also the passionist spirituality, which is my my uh, certainly my heart and soul is the passion of spirituality. So I love this spirituality. That's really where I love to be is in the passion. And uh, so, yes, it is deeply in the scriptures, but I think it's taking it's bringing out something in the scriptures and in in the liturgy which was not as emphasized before, but it's simply it's simply mining the deposit of faith and bringing out more things and emphasizing more things that were not were not previously emphasized. I, and I my my hunch is because simply the early church did not meditate on the passion as much because the early church was focusing far more on the resurrection. And I'll explain why that is. Um, but if we absolutize that one aspect to exclude the other aspect, then we have a problem. Well, what is the other aspect? <clears throat> Let me just break down. I'm going to break down what is the Paschal mystery to the early church, and then I will bring in what does the SSPX say and why I find that problematic about this part. Um, so the, the, the Paschal mystery, the, the central typology of what happens at Easter and the cross and the resurrection, the central typology is the Passover. It's the St. John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's identifying Passover, which is the central rite that creates Israel, the central ritual, the central memorial. And he's identifying that with the Lamb of God. And in particular, it becomes the typology of, of destroying Pharaoh, going through the Red Sea, liberation from slavery, all becomes the typological interpretive key for the Paschal mystery. 
which is Jesus comes to destroy death itself, which I'll, I'll provide these scriptures in a moment. The, he destroys death itself. He destroys the devil, who is Pharaoh is, tip, is the typified of the devil. And he leads his people through the Red Sea, which is baptism from death to life. So 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out the old leaven that you may be me a new paste as you are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover is sacrificed. This is the chapter. Now, I'm going to argue all this from the ancient Roman rite. This is all contained in the ancient Roman rite, all this theology. Uh, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our sins and rose again for our justification. So if you absolutize the Anselmian view to an ex excessive degree, actually, the Protestants went off the rails. They, they went hardcore in this direction. They went so hardcore that there's no, among Protestants, there's absolutely no theology of the resurrection. The resurrection has no salvific efficacy. But Romans 4.25 says he rose again for our justification. Well, if you absolutize this in this sort of Protestant substitution, substitutionary atonement sense, the resurrection does nothing for your salvation. But Romans 4.25 says it does. First John 3.8, uh, the son of God appeared that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Christ is doing battle with the devil, who is Pharaoh. Hebrews 2, 14. Um, that through death, he might destroy him who had the empire of death, that is to say, the devil. So this is the destruction of death. This is the paschal mystery, this paschal, the, the basics of the, of the uh, apostolic preaching. Destroying death, destroying the power of death. So I already mentioned Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Also in the Greek liturgy, we have this phrase, which I love this phrase, um, in the grave with the body, but in Hades with the soul, in paradise with the thief, and on the throne with the Father and the Spirit, wast thou, O Christ, filling all things, thyself uncircumscribed. So Christ is filling all things. He's in all places and destroying death. He's in Hades. He's in heaven. He's in all things, destroying the power of the devil. So then we have St. Melito of Sardis, who's an early father. He's one of the, what's called the apostolic fathers, who are the, the church fathers that are immediately preceding or immediately after the apostles, but before the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is St. Melito of Sardis, who was himself a Jew, but he was a bishop of Sardis in Asia Minor. And he says this, and this is in my book, uh, Introduction to the Bible, <clears throat> on his sermon on Pascha. He says, The scripture of the Hebrew Exodus has been read, and the words of the mystery have been made clear, how the sheep is sacrificed and the people are saved, and how Pharaoh, through the mystery, is plagued. Therefore, O beloved, understand how it is, new and old, eternal and passing, mortal and immortal. This is the mystery of Pascha. This is the Paschal mystery. Um Israel was guarded by the slaughter of the sheep and baptized together in shed blood. <laughs> oh, strange and ineffable mystery. Speak to me, O oh angel. What was it that persuaded you? The slaughter of the sheep or the life of the Lord, the death of the sheep or the type of the Lord, the blood of the sheep or the spirit of the Lord. So St. Melito is bringing out the fact that the Passover lamb itself in the actual Passover was itself efficacious because it was a participation in the very death of Christ, in the blood of Christ, in the, the conquering of Christ over Pharaoh. Um, and so he, he goes on in, in many, many of these typological references. Now, I've already mentioned in the uh, Easter sequence, um, Victime Pascali Laudes. Now, this dates to about the 11th century in the West, uh, but it speaks of this same the same thing life and death in combat fierce engage marvel dazzling every age prince of life by hellish monarch monster slain liveth now shall ever reign so it's this destruction of death destruction of the devil this combat um and then most significantly we have uh the the easter this is this is an ancient hymn from the, the 500s in the West. This is Ad Chainum Agum Providi. So this is the Vesperal hymn of uh, the, the Western Rite. This was later uh, replaced when Pope Urban VIII started messing with the liturgy. But that's another story. Um, 
So listen to this theology. And this is the typology of the Paschal mystery right here. The Lamb's high banquet we await, the Lamb of God, in snow-white robes of royal state. And now the Red Sea's channel passed to Christ our Prince we sing at last. The Paschal Eve, God's arm was bared, the devastating angel spared. By strength of hand, our hosts went free from Pharaoh's ruthless tyranny. Now Christ, our Paschal Lamb, is slain, the Lamb of God that knows no stain, the true oblation offered here, our own unleavened bread sincere. O thou from whom hell's monarch flies, O great, O very sacrifice, thy captive people are set free, and endless life restored in thee. For Christ, arising from the dead, from conquered hell, victorious sped, and thrust the tyrant down in chains, and paradise for man regains. So this whole concept of destroying death, fighting with the devil, destroying Pharaoh, all of this mystery, this Paschal mystery, is in the apostolic preaching. It's in the early church. It's in the early liturgies. This is all the Paschal mystery. These are all this, this emphasis on destroying death. This is the original emphasis. <laughs> But then it brings in more and more the, the passion, as I said, the Anselmian view, which is just another aspect. It's just another aspect of the same thing. Um, just when we absolutize it, it becomes problematic. So I have a problem with the way that the SSPX characterizes this. I tried to just spend some time talking about what is this Paschal mystery. Here's what the SSPX says on page uh, 39. The expression Paschal Mystery appears only a few times in the writings of the Church Fathers. In the ancient sacramentaries, it appears more frequently, but it's used in the plural. In the Galatian sacramentary, it's used once in the singular, in the Collect of the Holy Week. Now, this is where I have a big problem. SFPX says this, Until the 20th century, the expression had no special meaning in the writings of theologians. Yeah, I now, saw that too. Well, I mean... Well, but they go on now. Here's the I'll, I'll give you a taste of what I, I mean. It, I mean to say the SSPX is correct because they go on to basically say that, hey, they're using this Paschal mystery concept to promote modernism. And that's the SSPX central point. And then they use it to dissect and destroy the liturgy, which is another important point. Those are correct points. But I don't like how they characterize. They sort of dismiss the whole Paschal mystery. They say, well, this is a total innovation. And I say, no, that, that's not at all a total innovation. I, you, could, you could make an argument that the phrase Paschal Mystery, which is what they're kind of making an argument, they're making an argument that the phrase Paschal Mystery isn't an innovation. Okay, fine. But the concept of the Paschal Mystery is not at all an innovation. It's deeply, as I tried to show just now, it's totally in the Fathers, the Easter Church, Eastern Church, Early Church, Early Liturgies, East and West. It's all over the place. The Paschal Mystery, it's the central Passover mystery of the apostolic preaching. So I find this very problematic in the sense that it doesn't distinguish between antiquarianism, which is what the modernists do. They, they cherry pick something from the ancient church and they use it to promote modernism. That's antiquarianism. That's wrong. That's what they're fighting against. That's a correct. I, I love that. That's great. Thank you. SSPX. But then they don't distinguish between that and resource them all, which is actually, Hey, we've, kind of forgotten this in the west let's restore this concept because we've absolutized this aspect a little bit too much just let's just enrich our theology enrich our spirituality with this ancient thing so i don't like that there's no this there's not this distinction here so that's my critique number one i'm sure kennedy has many important points that he wants to raise here this might be the first time i've ever actually written notes down while tim was talking yeah <laughs> yeah okay so i'll, I'll begin and then I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be too long-winded, but that's impossible. So um, <laughs> first thing, they do make it clear, and I'm looking at the document here too, until the 20th century, the expression had no meaning. They said expression, not concept. So they're saying that the, using the expression Paschal Mystery was not a point of particular speciality, which Tim admitted. They didn't say concept. They said expression, so term, okay? Um, and they also said theologians, and theologians is a distinction. Church, you know, there's the theologians are an actual class of Catholic scholars between what around the 1100s, the 1700s or so. What do we call what that? The, whatever the era of the theologians is. So they're speaking about an era of study in the church, like 1200 to 1700. Yeah, not about yep. which is true. There was no um, special meaning in the writings of that set of of uh, Catholic intellectuals. Um, 
uh, wh whereas, of course, uh, you could find the concept earlier on in the church, but the expression, the term, is not does not have pride of place. Um, so in that sense, it is sort of an innovation. And also, though, the SSPX has demonstrated that they're not opposed to resource mod because they actually uh, not just begrudgingly accept the 55 Holy Week, but you'll when you speak to Luis Tufari, you'll actually find that um, they believe it's in some ways, in some ways it might be superior uh, because there are certain aspects that were lost that were helpful, like the washing of the feet. I know everyone cringes because you think of like washing of the feet with the Karen Susan Parish Council thing. Um, but it actually was something that had gone on for a long time in various cathedrals, and it always was a big deal in parts of uh, Rome, for example. It just was never standardized. So, and, and then also doing the liturgy at midnight was uh, was the way that it had been done in the past, um, rather than ending the vigil, uh, the vigil at noon, and, and lots of different things. Um, anyway, so they're not against resource malt in the slightest, and as far as that's concerned. Um, now, I will say um, it's correct, too, that when you read in Scripture about the Passover, uh, you mentioned basically how in the East it's emphasized that um, the Passover is a redemption, so you're sort of it is biblical to celebrate this redemption. However, um, when you look at what happens after the Passover, um, there's an insistence on the being redeemed by this great act. However... The practice liturgically is almost one is ex almost exclusively of sacrifice and atonement. Um, when you look at the consistent sacrifices going on in the temple, when you look at the um, basically the liturgy, I mean, we could, the liturgical rites before there was a true mass, the liturgical rites of the Jews uh, were almost completely about sacrifice um, and atonement. So it's rec it's almost like a balance. There's recognized that there's this ineffable, inexplicable thing that's been done by God Almighty. And the way that we unite ourselves to that is in continual atonement for the things that we continue to transgress. So there it's is a good, a balance good point. There. Good point. Yeah. Um, and um, I would also say emphasis emphasizing is not absolutizing. You know, maybe maybe Chesterton was a was a personalist because he I'm yeah good joking, point too. But he said, uh, well, actually, everyone quotes Chesterton and they just make it up. So I'm just going to pretend he said it. But I think he did say it. <laughs> Uh, but I believe he said, uh, you know, a, a, heres a, vir a, a, vir a heresy or a vice is one virtue exalted above all the others, you know, which would be absolutizing a certain point, right? And, and that, that that's what would be true. JP2 had a way of saying it that confused the heck out of me, but the <laughs> yeah, same <right>. thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I will say, though, if there is an overemphasis of the passion on the one hand, the opposite is true in the new paradigm. That's true. Um, right. Goodness Good gracious. Point. We are an Easter people. It's like, well, right. <laughs> um, and, and they, and they use that to, they use that. I mean, that's the main point of SSPX is like, they use this Paschal mystery Easter only thing to mm -hmm. say like, well, you should never kneel to receive communion. Like yeah. let's add the resurrection to the stations of the cross. Let's just, all that's bad. Let's not do that. You know, yeah. they've used it to really destroy things. Yeah, you're right. And, and it's true. And the Eastern thing, uh, cause you know, everyone even knows I'm soft on the Orthodox. I love me some Easterns, but, but, um, but I think it's wrong to emphasize Eastern theology in Western Catholicism in Roman Catholicism, not, and again, we're talking about liturgical reform here. We're not talking about, um, how theologians and Catholics may understand the depths of the Catholic faith. That's different. I mean, you know, you're, you're a, you're a Roman right Catholic and you like the Jesus prayer and the shot key and you pick up the Philokalia. Like, that's great. I mean, if it, I mean, you, you know, but like, there's lots of things in the East that seem completely insane, not insane. I shouldn't say that. They seem they're, un, they're an incomprehensible to the Western mind. Like theosis, yeah. theosis is a wonderful term, but to the, let's say uh Thomistic mind, it, it, you know, like, like surface Thomistic, it might come off as pantheism, you know, you're going to become God. Whoa, what does that mean? I mean, you know, we find that in Bonaventure, obviously, in this communion prayer, like, of course, there's, there's, we can understand that, but it's very difficult for the Western mind to understand. Um, in addition, um, they do emphasize the mysteries in the East, for sure, but they live the passion more than we do. Um, their life is constant fasting and suffering. Um, so, if they are emphasizing the redemptive, mysterious aspect of Christ's salvific activity, this is true, and that's a wonderful thing, but they live, in a way, more of the passion in their daily lives and in the liturgical 
rhythms than we do in the West. So it's balanced. Whereas what happens with the new paradigm is that the atonement and et cetera is not emphasized at all. And, and then it's not lived at all. So you have uh, just an imbalance. Last thing I'll say just quickly. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons why the SSPX is talking about the, the expression had no special meaning in the writings of the theologians, meaning that distinction that, you know, that category of, of, of theological patrimony. I think one of the reasons there is you get to a certain point, you know, let's just, let's pick a date around 1100, 1200. You get to a certain point when um, Eastern and Western theology has really grown into its own thing. And you have like a thousand years of cultural understanding that are necessary to understand things properly, which is why the East are so particular about if you're going to become Byzantine, you have to be, you're Catholic, but you actually have to be initiated into a new rite, and you got to change a lot of stuff, you know, um, because it's kind of like the communion on the hand debate. Sure, in the East, there are some churches like in, in the Syro Malinacras or, or um, Malankaras or the Malin, whichever one did it. They did communion on the hand, but it was like, I think even culturally, the understanding of hands is different there. <laughs> and and then, you know, you add to that, for example, like the deep bowing and the incensing, the licking of the palms. I mean, this is, this is, there's no concept of this in the West. So introducing communion on the hand in the West can only be to Protestantize it. Right. But if you had a thousand years of understanding in a different sense, you know, so I just think uh, in conclusion, um, the East should stay East and the West should stay West because they're a thousand years apart as far as even just basic terms, the way they use language. And that creates a danger. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I think you make a lot of great points. Like I said, Kennedy, Jake or uh, Paley, correct? Y'all want to. Yeah. I'll chime in. Uh for a moment. So I, I would actually disagree that that phrase refers to those specific theologians, because normally when that's the case, it's either scholastics with a capital S, schoolmen with a capital S, or theologians with a capital T to indicate a proper set of of people. When I was reading over that last night, and I, I could be wrong, but just my impression is that um, the society didn't mean to say that it has no special meaning in scholastic theology, uh, but up until the 20th century, this term was an empty set, basically. And so, I don't know, it's, it strikes me as maybe a caricature or, or maybe a half-truth um, that's got enough behind it. You know, they, they spent um, the, the part of that paragraph saying, well, you know, it's really only in the Fathers a few times, and it's only in the Missal this once on the Collect. Um, so really, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just use it. Right. And, and granted, you know, I, I concede Kennedy's point that they said expression, not concept, but expressions are only there to get convey a concept. So if the expression is meaningless, then what is the concept behind that? Uh, and then secondly, so it seems like, you know, Kennedy, your point about the East living it is, is actually a really strong critique. But I would say that if we don't live and emphasize both aspects or or all three aspects really if you think about um thursday friday and sunday then we're diminishing all of them so we can't really elevate the passion if we don't have the corresponding elevation of the resurrection because if we're solely focused on the atonement and the sorrow and the pain and uh, you know purging myself of sin and constant fasting and for what uh where where is the end game here and now i you know granted the end game is at the end of our lives god willing but the way they speak in the scriptures the way they speak in in the early church east and west is that the end game is now Right. Even as late as um, St. Teresa of Avila, she says, I, I think it's her, something like all the way to heaven is heaven. So all the way to heaven isn't just carrying my cross and, and fasting and, and expiating my sins vicariously through the sacrifice of the mass, but Easter joy. So, you know, I kind of cringe as well when I hear, oh, we're an Easter people. I'm like, oh, that's nice. That's great. You probably wear Birkenstocks to church. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but at the same time, though, it's like, no, oh, that there's something good about that. You know, in my parish a couple of years ago, we had a big debate over 
whether you could eat meat during Lent on Friday if it was St. Joseph's. And some of us were like, yes, live it up. That's what these celebrations are there for. And other people were like, St. Joseph would be so upset at you right now. You should be doing penance. I was like, I think he would want me to have a cheeseburger. I think we can have both. Anyhow, all right. I'm just, Logic, I'm you just put a target <laughs> on your back, bro. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, it's, it's coming it's after you. <laughs> Anyways, we'll have uh, Paleocrat, you, you provide yeah. your comments, and we'll have Kennedy provide his last word <sighs> of defense. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a whole bunch to add, but I'll say this. You know, when, when two things. Um, number one, I really like what, uh, what Jake was saying about uh, understanding them together, right? For example, um, let me see here. Oh, I think I, oh no, never mind. Hold on. I got it down here. <laughs> I removed it from my tab so that it was at the bottom of the screen so I could read it while I was talking. And then I forgot that I did that. Um, you know, talking about um, understanding something within the context of something else and the necessity of that. So uh, Frank Sheed, and I forget which book, a, a guy in the Wolfpack chat was quoting something at length, talking about Catholicism as a, a system that we see it holistically, that, it, that different parts connect with different parts is systematic. And so the idea of the connection between the, the passion and the death and the resurrection and the ascension. And the, the issue that she brought up was if you were to have just a plate with eyes on it, but it was not, you had no concept of, of the face that normally eyes would go into, what would those things be other than weird looking and gross on a plate, right? Um, kind of an eerie, um, uh, metaphor right but at the same time the imagery is kind of weird but the idea being that we understand those eyes insofar as we connect them with a face and it gives meaning to it insofar as it's connected to something else and so when these things are connected it gives it gives context it gives meaning and without that it's not and that plays into the second part is is there's a book um it's called the the i think it's called the devil knows latin um it's a really great book and it talks about the need to get back to classics, to get back to learning about Latin. But there's an interesting a, a, a part of the first chapter, if I'm remembering correctly, about the role of Greek and Latin together on our language, for example. And it was saying, take it gives an example of a, a paragraph and says, now here's this paragraph, common enough. Now let's remove every word that's in Latin and Greek and see what we have left. And it's hardly anything. I think that that's true in a way about our church, that if we look at if we want to keep those things separate, we're more we're more like an ecumenical dialogue with the East. That's our brother who came to sub submit to the Pope and be one with us. But if we look back and we say, look at all of the councils where we were with them and the struggles. Kennedy's right their their, con their concepts are different. Jake's series is all about this, talking about. The struggles that happen when you have a conceptual framework in the East that's different from a conceptual framework in the West. But one of the things that makes us different than Eastern Orthodoxy is that we brought we bring these things together. Right. We say we're a continuation of that. Right. Of course, they would say the same. But for us, we say we're a continuation of this. But that means that at the foundational level, if we were to take out the Greek concepts and remove those, then it would be a lot like that book. And we would be left with very few things. And I think that to then once we once we've had that foundation that with those councils where we debated those difficult concepts, invoking Greek language and everything. Right. And debating it afterward because it, it was like differences in the way they understood these things. But that that's part of our experience. And did that, that help to form us at a foundational level that to later on down the road? to consign that group more to the realm of where we would kind of be with, you know, dialogue with the East and everything else. Um, I don't know if I'd go with that, you know, and I think that because they're one with us, because they, they, they came and they subjected themselves to the church and said, we want to be part of this church. We want to submit ourselves to the Pope that we are continuing that 2000 year tradition of Greek and Latin in our uh, theological and liturgical vocabulary. Excellent. Thanks, Jeremiah. Kennedy, you want to provide uh, final thoughts? Then we'll uh, sure. close it out. <clears throat> um, to reemphasize, it doesn't say that the the term Paschal Mystery doesn't have meaning, but it's just that it didn't have a special emphasis. Um, 
in the way that it's presented now. So that would be different. Um, but also, it's not obvious to me that the West doesn't have a special um, understanding of the redemption in a proper sense. I mean, uh, we're singing the Regina Celli right now, you know, instead of the Angelus. You know, there's, there's a reason for that. We're in Paschal Tide. Um, you know, there's lots of fat feasting. I mean, you know, there's tons of, of merriment. I mean, you don't get a cultural history like Ireland where you've got, you know, great music and drinks flowing and, and, and fun dancing that comes out of a Catholic history if it's all suffering, right? I mean, I, I think that, I think that, you know, it's been so imbalanced in the last 60 years, like just, and I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't mean heretical. I just mean imbalanced. I mean, it's like, there's no center. Right. Um, and I think that, well, uh, Jeremiah is right that we, we need to obviously incorporate the East. Of course we do, but I don't even think that the Eastern concept was really developed with this whole Paschal mystery thing. I think it was cherry picked. So, so if they properly developed this idea of how the Paschal mystery would be understood by Eastern qua Eastern, that'd be one thing, but it's used as a term to then sort of make helter skelter the Western spirituality, um, which is, the, that's, this is again, why it's so, we have to be so careful. Uh, and we're speaking liturgically here. We're not talking about Again, like, you know, let's just say in some way we're trying to do East-West together and, and have some good times. That's great. But that would have to start with like decades of in our Catholic universities that are still Catholic somehow. You know, we begin to understand the Eastern Fathers more in depth so we can, you know, like there would be a, it, it wouldn't be something where within a series of months or, or, or a few short years, you know, you sort of change everything and then say, no, no, don't worry. It's Eastern. And it's like, what's Eastern? We had, we, I don't even know what Eastern is, you know, and, and the average Catholic really doesn't. Right. And this comes down to, um, uh, the, the this critique of liturgical reform. It's, it's, it's getting at the heart of, um, the Lex Horendi, Lex Credendi. I mean, again, theologians like Ratzinger and, and, and Gary Le Lagrange and, and, and Rotiwa and all these people, they can look at these things with their big brains and their big libraries. And they can say, yes, I can totally see this. But if you show up to mass and it's like, we don't fast anymore. And now we talk about we're Easter people and Paschal mystery and it's all in English. It's like, what on earth just happened, right? So that it's it's a critique of liturgical reform, not necessarily a critique of of uh, trying to understand the East better or something like that. So to con to conclude, I would say again, it is true that at least, and I'm also the SSPX, they are Romans, right? It's Roman Catholicism. So I don't know what it's like reading. I don't know what it's like reading. Writings from Eastern theologians in a contemporary time. Um, I don't know if they would always uh, distinguish between East and West. Like, would an Eastern theologian say, you know, in the church today we see X, Y, and Z? Would they would they make it specific that they only mean the Byzantine, or would that just be the way they speak? I mean, here the SSPX is speaking as a Roman rite group of priests about the Roman liturgy. I think it must be understood that they're talking about the Roman context, not necessarily what would be understood. I think that's just I think that would just be inside. That's just commonplace. And then uh, lastly, um, again, I don't think there is a no emphasis on, I think this is kind of one of those red herrings from the Vatican II era is well, we don't want to be like those doom and gloom. And it's like, well, hold on a sec. We're just, we were just drinking and like eating a roast beef and, 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 <laughs> and singing songs about the resurrection. I don't know what doom and gloom? I mean, yeah, Lent was hard, but teacher tide's great. I mean, I think we've always had both. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I, I mean, I agree. I think we all agree on, on many, many aspects of this. I, I think that the my, my, my biggest problem was that the way that they characterize this seemed to dismiss any sort of resource and all concept of the Paschal mystery. That's that's my problem with this section in this in this text. But as you said, Kennedy, I mean, all your points are spot on, especially when we talk about I love what you just said about the you know the highbrow theologians and their ivory towers they can they can reconcile everything but then when it goes down in, into the you know common faithful and you everybody talks about we're an easter people and we don't want to do the the stations of the cross we want to add the resurrection all this stuff 
that I, I totally, I mean, it's, this is the whole problem with Vatican II is you have theologians who like can reconcile everything. There's no rupture, but then when it goes down to the pastoral level on the ground, it's a disaster. Um, I really liked what the SSBX said on page 50, because this is where I think it's really, really important. What they said is they said um, the feast of the precious blood, mm -hmm. which says in its traditional collect, almighty and everlasting God, who it says point that only begotten son of the redeemed world, this vows to be appeased by his blood. Grant we beseech thee, we may so venerate the price of our redemption and its power, be so defended from the evils of this present life that we may enjoy its fruit forever in heaven. And so true resource among is you keep the old tradition and you just add a new one. That's actual resource among. But what actually happened with the liturgical reform, which is what the SSPX says, is we just deleted the rest. Like this is there's only 13% of the old mass in the new Novus Ordo, 13%. That's a delete, a massive deletion of all these prayers that they didn't like. That's not resource them on anymore. That's just deleting the old traditions and adding new ones. So I think that this is, this is where the biggest problem comes in is the actual text of the Novus Ordo, which ends up being, uh, because of this whole issue, it becomes this problem. Uh, but, Every all shout out to all the SSPX. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, all the SSPXers who watch this video, we're gonna have another uh, on 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 my my series uh, Benedict uh, Benedict's the Trads. We'll have um, Cardinal Ratzinger in this text is recorded. Cardinal Ratzinger made a speech right after this was published in two thousand one, and in this speech, he actually vindicates the SSPX in very very important ways. So we're gonna talk about that on Benedict. Benedict vindicates the trads this Friday. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll get back to that. So we'll provide more of why the SSPX is making an important argument. Um, but in this, we try, like I tried to uh, get all the different nuances and everything, all these aspects. So stay tuned for that. Uh, be sure to check out the Kennedy report. I have the link below for subscribing to Kennedy's channel. Please help grow Kennedy's channel, share Kennedy's channel, like, and subscribe. Uh, make sure that, uh, this this good stuff grows so without anything further you know oh, i didn't i did not prepare an easter uh, an easter he looks really I grumpy can't. about this and you know what i realized <laughs> yeah he, fr he you froze it like he's like i didn't uh, <laughs> like froze in the <laughs> er part yeah well, that's hilarious yeah that's a good yeah, screenshot I has, has my audio been okay? I know it's I've good. been a little choppy in the video. Yeah, your audio, audio keeps... Audio through, okay. This is the only time it didn't. It's the only time it didn't, man. Um, okay. Well, you had to realize that I want to add to our 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 um, prayers is the, is uh, St. Joseph Terror of Demons pray for us because um, this show is the Terror of Demons. It's named after Kennedy's book. Y'all need to buy Kennedy's book. If you haven't, buy another one. If you've already read it, buy another one. Give it to a priest. <laughs> Or give it to a yeah, father, give, give it to, it to a, another man, mm -hmm. give it to a woman and say, well, this is the type of man you need, you know, single women, especially this is like, you have to measure up to St. Joseph terror of demons. That's, that's what you have to measure up to. Uh, if you don't have a man who's becoming St. Joseph terror of demons, get a man like that, or give it to your husband, tell him to shape up, whatever. So check out the book, uh, St. Joseph terror of demons, but I'm just going to add um, our lady of victory, pray for us and St. Joseph terror of demons, pray for us. And that'll be especially for the intentions of this apostolate and the needs of all guild members. So let's pray. In nomine Patris, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Pater Noster, Quies in Jaelis, Sancti Vegeto, Nomen Tuum, Advenia et Regnum Tuum, Fiat Voluntas Tua, Sicut in Cedo et in Terra. Pane Nostrum, Quotidianum da Nobis Odie, et Mitte Nobis Debita Nostra, Sicut et Nosti Mitimus Debitoribus Nostris, Nenos Inducas in Tentationem, Sed Libera Nosa Malo, Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Christ is risen. <laughs>